Um, good morning to everyone. My name is Stefano Gobbi. I'm a PhD student with the University of Trento and the Fondazione Edmund Mack in, uh, in Italy. And today I will present the um, uh, free and open software for geography uh, application part of my PhD study and perform the most difficult task in the world of taking my time and be on schedule. Uh, we will have a brief introduction about uh, what we are studying and why we are studying this kind of issue in Trentino or Provincia di Trento. Then we will see the materials and the methods we are using, which is the most uh, ambitious part of the program and the presentation. And then we will have a quick glimpse about uh, the partial result we have achieved in these two years of my PhD and a quick, uh, quicker glimpse on the partial conclusion we, are, we, we arrived. So, um, our aim in, our, in this project is to study the landscape changes. And landscape changes in a region like Trentino occurs between open areas, pastures and forest. And why is important? Because forests are not only the lungs of our world, but they regulate the water cycle that provides uh, shelter to animals and to us, that provide timbers and they provide a lot of other uh, ecosystem services which are fundamental for life, especially in the mountains. So, as uh, it states here from an article from my supervisor of some years ago, a deep understanding of the forest pass dynamics is crucial to know the conservation of the mountain areas and to trace a possible uh, evolution of, uh, the, um, of the forest uh, behavior, especially in those areas where there is a strong uh, link between uh, forest management and biodiversity. Monitoring landscape is uh, quite an interesting issue and if you try to type landscape change in uh, some research engine, they will give you a lot of uh, results. And how has been tackled this analysis? Well, uh, especially with uh, aerial images, maps uh, and other things from the past. So uh, trying to trace a um, temporal evolution and uh, uh, then the results of this uh, um, land use uh, analysis are um, summarized in landscape metrics, which are simply numbers which can help us to trace the evolution of, uh, um, of the uh, landscape change. Uh, why is undergoing these, um, these, uh, these changes? Well, technically, just because uh, of human intervention, because uh, as in the past, uh, the principal uh, activity in the mountains was agricultural and, uh, past and, and pasture. Now, uh, the population has moved into the cities and uh, lands in the high mountain have been abandoned. And so forests are now taking over the open areas. Uh, with a little help from climate change, which allowed the forest to move higher on the mountains. So the, color, the current study is trying to apply a well-known procedure from the literature to a very fine scale and in, into a very large area. Here we have a quick overview of the study area that I was talking about, which is Trentino, a region in the north part of Italy, uh, mostly covered by mountains, so which Mountains are covered by the exceeding of 60% by forest, and we have uh, also a lot of habitat in Natura 2000 network. So, uh, now we'll see some materials and the methods. As they were previously saying, your software is beautiful, but is useless without data. So the data we are using uh, are a lot of data. The first of, it, of the data in uh, a time, in the time series is the 1959 cadastral maps, uh, which were uh, firstly made by the Asburgic Empire in order to control and to uh, cadastre the whole territory of the, their 
in peripheral region. In fact, these maps are the same here in Trentino as they are in Czech Republic, in Poland, I think, uh, in Hungary, and in all the uh, neighbors of, uh, of the Asburgic Empire. Uh, they are cadastral, so each parcel is colored by a background color. And for instance, here you can see a particular of Trento city. And the gray area that you see, the gray spot that you can see here, is uh, usually indicates a forest. So uh, this forest is still here in Trento city. Now, of course, the city has expanded, but the forest is still here. Then we have, in 1930, the Italian Kingdom forestry map, which are also a sort of cadastral map. Here, uh, the ambitious project by Mussolini was to map all the forests in Italy, and uh, they managed to do that at a larger scale. The previous scale was very detailed. This one is a scale about one to a thousand, a hundred thousand. And um, uh, the background color here indicates a type of forest, so pine forest, chestnut forest, beech forest, and uh, and so on. Uh, the other background color, the white background color, we are not really interested in it. Then we move to the 1950s, when we have the first uh, aerial images. Uh, this one were taken just right after, before the war. And for Trentino, we have to overcome the first problem with GRASS-GIS, which is the auto-rectification of, of this whole data set, because these images are taken and uh, uh, just left there to take dust in some archive. We retrieve them, and we have to digitalize them first and then auto-rectify them. Then we have the 1973 aerial images, which uh, Marcus Nettler, a lot of years ago, auto-rectified the 1994 aerial imagery, and then we start with the series of um, colored aerial images, which the 2006 and 2015 aerial imagery. The software used uh, were, first of all, QGIS, which I think it needs no presentation, and as well, GRASGIS. I don't think it needs any presentation. As I was saying earlier, the first problem we have to overcome was the auto-rectification of uh, the 1954 dataset, which has been performed with two different versions of GRASS-GIS, the 6.4 and the 7.4. Uh, auto-rectifying means to transform a flat image, which has his own reference system, into a, a reference system with a datum. And in the process, the image will be curved and adapted to a digital elevation model of the territory it depicts. So the steps that we take to order to find image are, first of all, set a target location, which means assigning to uh, the, the first image um, uh, a reference system. Then use select a digital elevation model. Then input a bunch of information from the camera, which, has, which took the photo in the first place. And then uh, the I.O., which is not input-output, but is internal orientation of the image, which means translating from a pixel uh, reference system to a meter reference system. Then input some ground control points, which is the part which required the use of GRASS 6.4 and GRASS 7.4. In the 7.4, uh, the user interface was more usable and more uh, accessible and uh, it permits to zoom in real time, to input uh, and cancel the ground control points, which are points uh, of known coordinates in both uh, the um, auto the image that needs auto-rectification and another reference and already rec uh, rectified images. And uh, I, uh, I was saying these ground control points in the 7.4, uh, we were able to change them, adapt them, and zoom in real time, uh, and cancel the ground control point if we, if we knew that it was, it was wrong and was going to uh, make wrong all the, all the process. And then after um, the process of ground control point, um, assessment, which is uh, iterative, uh, meaning that uh, uh, we obtain an error for each uh, ground control point, and when uh, we see that the error, we continue to uh, input ground control point until the error is low enough that we can accept this error to be uh, in the auto-rectified images. After that process, GRASS-JS with the i.rectify module uh, can perform the actual auto-rectification. 
the auto rectification which is performed by solving this collinearity equation, which are just two equations with a set of uh, a six um, incognita. Uh, so the solving on this equation is not, uh, a, um, is not perfect. It's, it uh, has to be, there is to be an error, which is why I was telling that the process of uh, inputting ground control points is uh, iterative. Then, after the, all the data set we are using is auto-rectified, which means that now we can use them in a, a reference system, is the turn to perform the land use land uh, classification. And this was performed by using uh, an object-based uh, image approach. That's because the resolution of our images, as we will see in a slide a little bit later, is uh, so that uh, each pixel uh, can represent uh, each object is, re is represented by um, represented on the map here is represented by um, a set of pixels. Uh, here we have a quick overview on the steps that we were able to automatize using Python, which is first of all we used i dot segment to segment and generate the object on the maps. Uh, with the help of r dot texture, uh, the segmented maps was inputted to i.segment.stats, which generates a bunch of, um, of uh, statistics about each segment, which are of uh, a ge um, geometrical statistics and radiometrical statistics. And then the segmented map was inputted to a machine learning process, which is a module called v.class.mlr. Uh, the training areas, which means the objects which are uh, belonging to some specific uh, uh, land use class, were, were inputted by hand on just one map. And just by using this map of, um, a, of training areas, we were able to uh, automatize this whole process for the whole map of a single temporal data set. So for instance, in the maps of 2006, we have one training map for the whole set of images, and so on for the others, uh, for the other um, set of temp temporal set of images. Here we can see a quick uh, overview of how it works. So this is the original images, then you can see the segmented images, uh, the vectorialization of the segmented images with uh, the whole uh, a set of parameters, and then the machine learning classification. And with the maps uh, of the 1959 cadaster, uh, the approach was slightly different, and that's just a matter of time and computational power and computational time because as you can as you will see uh, these uh, maps uh, are like a lot more than the others and uh, we didn't have enough computational time to perform an object image uh, classification upon them um, because they detail and so as you can see here uh, we proceeded to ha by hand with the vectorialization uh, from QGIS uh, to classify the areas we are interested in, or uh, the open areas, the forests, and the wooded pasture, which is uh, like something in between, uh, a situation in between forests and open areas. What saves your life in this process is the snapping tool and the other uh, automatic CAD tools uh, advanced CAD tools in QGIS, which allows to um, uh, to digitalize contiguous area in such a way that there are no overlapping, no island, nothing in between an area and another contiguous area, which saves literally your life when you are performing further analysis on uh, segmented uh, vectorial images. Uh, so all this input data, all these images, uh, contributes to trace the landscape change analysis in province of Trento. And as you can see here, these are the dimension and the number of images. Uh, the Austrian cadastral map is a uh, mistake, misses a one in front of a five. So they were uh, 15,000 file and that was, that's why we didn't have enough time to process the image with an object based uh, approach. So qu very quickly, here are some results. 
first of all, uh, with the help of GRASS 6.4 and 7.4, we were able to obtain a complete orthorectification of the 1954 data set. And this paper, which was published uh, in the in the last year proceedings of the Phosphor-G DAR uh, explains a little bit more in details and um, a more detailed paper is uh, on the way to be published and uh, submitted. Uh, the mean overall error, which I was talking about, is about uh, 9.8 meters uh, for the old images. This is just a statistic, it's not as all the statistic is not quite reliable, but if we want to trace a mean, it's about uh, 10 meters of error for each image. And this is, was considered uh, acceptable for, our purpose, for the purposes of our, uh, of our study. Can we improve the results? Of course we can. For instance, we uh, can use uh, the digital elevation model with uh, a more refined grid. And for instance, as you can see here, with the 10 by 10 meter resolution of the digital elevation models, there is a step area which is not uh, recognizable even by, by human eye. We, using the one by one meter resolution dam, we can see that the situation improves and what was like a blurred mm, shade now becomes like a valley bottom in some part of the park of Dolomiti of Paneveggio here. Uh, the map of the, nine, the 1859 was completely digitalized using uh, QGIS, and these are the, some statistics about uh, the situation, how it was in, nine, in 1859. And then uh, an example of the result of the classification with OBIA. Here I carefully selected a detail which can show how, um, how is the level of detail that can, reach, can be reached with uh, the object-based object uh, approach. As you can see, roads are clearly visible and classified correctly. And here is an, aband an abandoned cave which has been uh, classified as road which, I mean, it's quite uh, correct. Not correct, but quite. And then uh, the algorithm has perfectly discriminated between uh, what are trees and what are open areas, as is possible to see in the big area above. And uh, you can ask, well, this approach of using just one uh, trainer map for each temporal data set, will affect uh, the results, it will, but we can control how it will affect the result. As you can see, the red and yellow column represent the Cohen's kappa coefficient for the maximum likelihood and the SMAP approach. And uh, using uh, the same uh, uh, training areas with uh, two different maps, uh, lowers the accuracy on the maximum likelihood and this map approach, while it's more stable using other approach which are all machine, SMV, SWV, AB, and, and so on. All the others are uh, machine learning approach on object-based uh, image. Uh, so we can, I think we can fairly say that we can control how the accuracy uh, will, uh, will work out for the whole data set. So, for concluding, GRASGIS was used uh, in every step of this research and will continue to be used uh, in the further step of our research. Uh, GRASGIS and QGIS were able to manage quite easily, I, will, I should say, the diversity of the input data, so between uh, black and white images, colored images, and uh, maps. The problem related to auto ratification was then easily solved by using RAGIS and on to recurring to some more complicated software like Micmac or I can't remember the name of the actual software, sorry. Um, the OBI approach was um, easily coded in 140 lines of code in Python, obviously, uh, which were used to analyze the whole dataset. QGIS provided to be a fast tool for visualizing and man-checking all the results we had. 
and the, as I was saying earlier, the QGIS uh, of tools of, for digitalizing prevented a lot of topological errors and speeded up the analysis of the 1959 dataset. Prediction will be made uh, for the evolution in the forest of Trento using uh, the... I'm out of time. Okay, sorry. But uh, this is just a presentation of the possible outcome of our research and the future of, uh, of our research. So, I finished. If you have any question, I'm here for you. Thank you. So thanks, thanks for a nice presentation. And I hope some, uh, that you have some questions. Perfect. Ah, uh, okay. Uh, the second question is, is, the, is the code that you described for running the OPI accessible? Okay, um, yeah, I'll, uh, then. The first question. The segmentation was optimized uh, using another module of GRASS, which I forgot to add there, but uh, there is this module ca called uh, i.segment.uspo, uh, which perform a segmentation of a small subset of your image. And then uh, uh, it has a bunch of, um, of output. Uh, it gives you uh, some output number. Uh, basically, if the output number is zero, the parameter you're using are completely wrong. If it's one, uh, the parameter you're using could be okay. It's not that they are okay. They could be okay. Uh, but then the, this poses another problem. Uh, which subset of my image should I use? And the problem is solved uh, by simply watching at your image and selecting an area which is uh, pretty segmented. Uh, for instance, an area between a forest and uh, a city where you have a lot of trees and then houses, roads, and so on, which are different objects, all one contiguous to, to the other. So by using the algorithm, uh, the module i.segment.uspo, uh, you should be fairly confident, in an area like this, you should be fairly confident that the parameter that you find here are okay for the whole image. You are fairly confident. And then, uh, yes. Answering to your second question, uh, the um, Python code that, that I used uh, will be available in Grass Git as we overcome some problem of optimization because now it's brutally hard coded. Uh, we have an idea, we came with the idea, and my PhD is like uh, uh, a continuous work in progress. So I'm trying to, to work out a way to optimize this, uh, this code and make it, it, uh, making it accessible for the old grass user. Uh, can you say a couple of words about the, the time it took to, the, to do this? Uh, first of all, uh, the time it took to digitize those, uh, the, the old maps. Okay. Um, uh, um, the digitalization of the, the cadastral maps were undertook in a month and a half, something like that. And uh, the segmentation, just the segmentation part, which excludes uh, the, all the other steps which need to be undertook, took like an hour and a half for each image. A little bit more if you count that the, the as you can see so it's ours, not yeah as you can see uh, there are this black band on the image which uh, crashes continuously crashes the i dot segment uh, module uh, because they are not null they are zero and the i dot segment doesn't like that <laughs> 